Welcome to Date with Danu. Today we are going to be speaking about the Constitution. Sri Lanka is facing quite a lot of changes these days and a lot of things around us are leading to one thing. Who is going to rule this country and who is going to rule it the right way? And while we hope that this happens soon, what are the steps that we need to take and what is the right step forward? To speak more about it, I have Harsha Fernando, Mahesh Sena Ratna, and George Cook on Date with Danu. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Harsha Fernando. I am a lawyer. I've been a lawyer for the last 25 years. I've worked in a number of places, including the government, both locally and internationally. I've been a practicing lawyer. In addition to that, I've been providing consultancy services uh, mainly in areas that are related to governance, public financial management, and things that I believe would ha have an impact on the general public. I'm George Cook, initiator of the Avalog Initiative and a senior lecturer at the University of Colombo. My area of focus is on foreign policy and understanding Sri Lanka's interactions with countries around the world. Hi, my name is Mahesh Sena Ratna. I'm an attorney at law by profession. Um, I've been practicing since 2010. I mainly do a lot of criminal law, some administrative law. I was very glad to be invited to, for, to this show because I think it's important that we do whatever we can within our respective capacities to spread the message to the people as to why it's important that all of us must come together especially during times when your country needs it. Dhanushtan, who is a good friend of mine, asked us to come and speak about the current situation in the country. And I think people, unfortunately, due to the education system in Sri Lanka, don't have like a deep knowledge of the constitution, remedies available to them, the rights that are available to people. So we are here to just give like a brief introduction and to talk about practical solutions going forward for the economic crisis and the constitutional crisis in the country. Sri Lanka is facing a national crisis, a crisis which has been brought about by a forex exchange crisis, which has led to a fuel crisis, we've had electricity crisis, we have a shortage of basic amenities in this country. The situation has gone from bad to worse, and it seems to be spiraling on a continuous basis. What we really need at this juncture is much greater awareness. Awareness of where we are right now, the potential of what can get even worse in the months and weeks ahead. And this is where Sri Lankans, all Sri Lankans, irrespective of community, irrespective of location in the country, need to be aware that the country is going through its worst crisis to date in considering all of what has happened, especially in the last 74 years. Welcome. We are dealing with a lot of things around us. We have Gota Gogama, Maina Gogama, Hora Gogama. There are so many Gogamas. But why is this out there today? Why are we dealing with what we have to deal with? Uh, we record this show on a date where there are no buses, no trains, no public transport. Mostly all shops are closed. The big Haratal is happening today and it's a Friday. Uh, so thank you for being here. It's a tough day to get to uh, where we are to record this show. Uh, to start things off, uh, I would have to say a big thank you to all of you for giving me some time from your busy schedule. Um, I will start with you, Harsha. Um, I think I, I spoke to you about this thing called constitution and you said, oh, Danu, that's a big subject. How long do we have to talk about? The constitution is very important for a country and to see the future of it. Tell us today, what, do we hope, what can we hope for as a change that's going to make this a better country for us to live in? Uh, first of all, Danu, thank you for inviting me on the show and also for selecting this particular topic. I think it's very important. Um, you asked what can you hope through a constitution. You see, it depends on how you see the constitution and how we define the constitution. For me, if you give a very basic definition, the constitution is about our agreement as we, how we come together as a nation and how we want to move forward as a nation. Obviously, with a nation of 
22 million people. We need to come up with a mechanism to move forward. So we need somebody to lead us. We need to make sure that our services are provided. Money is raised. We need to make sure that our voices are heard so that our futures will be secured. To do all that, we have invented a system called government and the governance. So I think the constitution is the ultimate and the basic document that puts it in, in order. The document where you can find the way we want to live our lives as citizens of this nation called Sri Lanka. And I believe as a lawyer that it is through a constitutional means that we can hope to make any progress. It is through constitutional means that we can hope to resolve our differences and disputes. Some of it are small, some of it are major. But if we all can begin to look at the constitution in that way, then we will begin to see it's a document that should be part of our everyday life, something that all of us should be conversant with. Not necessarily the each and every section and article in the constitution, but the concept of why we need the constitution because that is where the initial and the most important principle of that we are subjected to a law and not to a king, not to the dictates of just one or two people, but to the dictates of a law properly made through a democratic and a representative process through our representatives in parliament. It is that that gives us that way to govern ourselves and I think Today, most of the problems that has brought the country to where what you just said, where we are today, I believe is uh, because of blatant violation of certain laws, as well as our disrespect to some of the conventions on which a constitution actually operates, if we can call ourselves a regularly organized civilized society. So, I'm very glad that, that you have in, uh, coming into this uh, topic and as to where we go from here, I think the answer we'll have to find through the discussion as it proceeds. Today. Uh, George uh, also does a show with us on High TV. Uh, one of the reasons you have worked with the foreign services for a long time. I wanted to ask you, uh, Sri Lanka went through so many changes. What do you see as the future looking at other countries that have gone through similar problems. What can you see that we don't understand that is yet to come? One thing that we need to focus on first is awareness. And that is where programs of this nature, any program, any kind of awareness building becomes all the more important. Because people have got to know what is happening. They've got to realize, they've got to understand. Lots of people in this country had nothing to do with the constitution. They don't look at it, they don't read it, they don't refer to it. They just know that there is something called a constitution. That is Do left the members of parliament know the constitution for uh, you? Interesting question. Uh, who knows? Who knows? And this is where we come to a situation in which people are now becoming that much more conscious. Conscious not just of the constitution, conscious of our rights, conscious of what is happening in our country, systems of governance. Now there is awareness coming up. And this is something that we've been talking about for a very long time. Second thing that we need to focus on getting out of this is strategizing where we want to be. The last time I was on your program also I mentioned this. I do this on the Sri Lankan understanding over and over again. We talk about the need to strategize. Where are we going? What do we want to achieve? What is the objective that we have? You and I strategize on a daily basis when it comes to planning our day. How much more a country should be doing? How much more we should be setting targets of what we want to achieve in our neighborhood, in our region, looking at other countries? We are nowhere there. We are nowhere there. We have fallen short in a big way. And it has now come to a situation in which we are scrambling. We are unsure. Our reserves have gone down. We don't know where our next shipment is coming from. We don't know whether we can pay for the next shipment of fuel coming to this country. We don't know what kind of shortages are going to be there. These are things that people are now getting very concerned about because life is being threatened at the very core. Economically, it is hitting people. People started protesting when power cuts were extended and extended up to 13 hours. 
At that point, people were like, enough is enough. They're going onto the roads. That's how things really started going bad. And this is where we are now coming to a juncture where people are realizing, no, enough is enough. We are not going to take this anymore. We have to step out. And this is the democracy. Let us not forget, Sri Lanka is the oldest democracy in this part of the world. If we are not going to protest, if we are not going to have the rights to get onto the roads, if we are not going to be able to voice our opinions, what is this uh, democracy that we have for the last 90 years? We've got to be ashamed of it then. Thankfully, we are not. Thankfully, people are standing up. Thankfully, people are raising questions. People have the right to do that. People should be allowed to do that. This is where it's amazing. For example, uh, you have two members of the um, uh, legal fraternity here as well. The legal fraternity has come forward. The Bar Association is making a huge difference. This is where people now feel democracy is working. We, the voice of the people is being heard. Of course, I am representing you because I do not understand most of it, just like how most of us may not. And I'm just trying to get the answers that might need the, um, that you might need to understand and fathom what's happening around us. Now, we have always taken other countries when we say, oh, they buy bread for like so many millions. You know, we have always spoken about it and we have read it off books and seen it on TV. But is that going to happen to us? And how long do we have before it gets to a million, a pound of bread? <laughs> uh, hopefully never. Uh, but obviously, we, we do we want to compare ourselves with the worst of the worst? Do we want to get there? We don't. We have to stop this. This has got to end. We've got to take stock of what is going on. There have got to be the correct people in the correct places. Thankfully, certain people who are misleading the economy are not in those positions anymore, very thankfully. Others have been brought in. Hopefully, we are going to see change. But they can't work miracles. They are not magicians. It's going to take time. It's a lot of years of uh, wrong strategies, wrong policies, which have brought us to where we are right now. And this is where it is at this particular juncture, at least, that we have to realize, think Sri Lankan. Stop with this whole thing of how am I going to make my commission? Where am I going to get my next uh, million rupees or million dollars or whatever the people are making? Where is this consciousness? Do you not have a conscience? Does it not prick you? Are you so thick? This is corruption at every level. This is something that has crept into the system which we have to stop. People have to stop doing that. We've got to start saying no. As I said earlier, enough is enough. Uh, Mahesh, uh, I wanted to ask you, holding people accountable, it's mm. something that only now we are asking, you know, give us the money back, tell us, a club, like, you know, tell us what are your assets. We have actually asked these things, and mm. these are placards that have been held. What is the process of getting it out there, getting all of this to be seen for us to you know, check on all the properties that a government servant could own and how, how did they become billionaires? So it's, it's not as easy as it would seem, Dhanu. First of all, for there to be accountability, I believe there has to be political will. Political will amongst elected representatives, political will amongst us as citizens of this country to hold politicians, elected officials responsible or government officials responsible. As in, not reward them for corruption, not reward them for spouting lies at election. So that accountability is also important. Now, when it comes to a legal aspect of it, first of all, let's look at the reality of it. So you have an office of a elected representative. You have the son as a personal secretary, the other son as an additional secretary, uh, a nephew as a coordinating secretary. Right? None of these people were elected by the people. So how do you stop that? And it is really important to note that it's if there is mismanagement, if there is misappropriation, it's not necessarily held in the elected representative's name. It's held in other people's names. It's, it's the co it's according to the secretaries, that person. So there are different ways that this misappropriation occurs. So to get the money back, it's, it's a bit of a journey. First of all, there has to be an offense, right? A person will have to be convicted of an offense. Then you have to go on this journey to find out where this money is, right? So that takes expertise. 
Now, for instance, um, in 2015, when the Yaha Parvinia came in, they, they established the FCID. But the problem with the FCID was that it was investigators from the CID who were supplanted there. Now, do they have the necessary know-how to look at shell companies, to follow money, la money laundering? Because what usually happens here is now I go and complain to the Frauds Bureau or the CID saying, listen, there's been a fraud. So then they take down my complaint. Then they will go to the court and say, there has been a complaint against this person. This is the ID number. Please issue me an order so that we can check all the bank accounts, if there are accounts under this name, to see where this money has gone. Now, that methodology will not work in a situation where money has been taken out in different ways. I mean, you, you forget it's not about uh, over budgeting at a ministry. It's about where it's about a tender and where the money has come from a tender. Where, where, who has taken that money? How was it awarded? What what was the process that was followed? So it, this these systems have been perfected over the last fifty years, right? With the law that is available, so you need people who can follow the money trail at the investigation process. So. In, in, in the UK, they have forensic auditors who actually do, there's a forensic auditor's office who do these investigations. So they're accountants, professional accountants who are trained to do investigations to follow money trails. So we need something like that to first follow the money trail, to find out where it is. Then if you find evidence, then you charge them. We can go to the FBI, we can ask for assistance. But it is only once you find that trail, once that investigation occurs, then you have to convict them, and then you can get the money back. We are not going to see it in our times, are we? Well, again, it is the political will. Now, again, in the UK, there's, there's, now they have, they have, they issue these orders called unexplained wealth orders. Uh, that is for public servants as well as people who, uh, for organized crime. So, if you, if you have a billion-dollar house, how do you have this billion-dollar house? Explain it, show it, but there is a process. Of course, it's, there are checks and balances in place. So these are the thing, kind of things that we need here. If a politician has a house, it is a billion dollars, how did you get this? You don't need to go follow all this trail of money. Explain how you have this 50 million uh, car and a 100 million house. How do you have it? All right. Uh, we're going to be speaking about the changes that happened in the Constitution over the years. Uh, that either crippled us, benefited us. Let's speak more when we do come back. Do stick around. It's taking back. Welcome back to the show. I'm sure we all know going somewhere to buy something for yourself is now harder than what it used to be. 5,000 rupees is just literally nothing in your hand. It melts away so fast if uh, people have shut down businesses, people who have become uh, entrepreneurs using Instagram, Facebook as platforms, recruited a few people, started a business, uh, they had to close down because it's impossible to run it. So these have been the things that you and I have seen. But this point, this tipping point in our economy has been building up for a long time. But where did we see these signs and when did we ignore them? I want to ask um, Harsha if you can tell us what was that point? What has been the tipping point? And how did it all just erupt this year? I think it's a, it's a gradual, pro, um, uh, gradually it built up. Maybe one or two things really took us over the top. So, I mean, if you mean tipping point that way, I mean, that is how I would sort of redefine it. But the question is, for this current crisis, there are a number of reasons, number of reasons. I can certainly speak about from the legal angle, there will be the economic reasons, and even people's attitudes, our voting patterns, how we understand democracy, all those contribute. But I think the law, the constitution has a great way to sort of connect everything together. And I think that's where uh, the rule of law becomes important once again, which I mentioned to you earlier. I would put this into two things in my personal opinion. One is lack of accountability. And the other one is uh, our 
weak governance. I know that governance, the word governance had got associated with one political party, unfortunately, so let's leave that aside. <laughs> but you can take the word governance itself, what do you mean by governance and good governance and mm -hmm. accountability? If you look at our constitution, you see what a lot of people don't realize is there is only one thing that the government is supposed to do and that's the only thing that they can do is to spend money. Every other institution, every other individual earns money. Government only spends money. That's true. Right? It doesn't generate money. Every time the government tries to get into business, ended up becoming a loss-making institute. Right? Now, if we take that reality, then the question is, how do you ensure that the government doesn't spend our money in a haphazard manner? Theft, bribery is one thing. What about bad decisions, bad policies, wrong decisions, not being so strategic? You see, the unfortunate thing and the beauty of it all is that our systems are fairly robust. If you really look at it, the financial regulations, the establishment code, most of our laws are, are almost there in terms of international standards. So where did we go wrong? That's where I come back to the issue of accountability. Now, you mentioned about the Constitution. Let's approach the issue from the constitutional side. My professional life as a lawyer started in 1996, the, 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 the year after I, t I took oaths. So during from that time onwards, if you look at it, we studied the 78th Constitution in uh, law school, where we had the first time the executive president with a lot of power. And uh, we always heard both sides, some were against it, some were for it. But one of the strongest arguments that was put forward for the executive presidency was that we needed a strong leadership to take the country out of the economic um, situation we were in after our economic policies from 72 to 77. Mm. And they said, no, we need rapid changes. We need a lot of quick results on the ground. And if we have to access international resources, primarily financial resources, we need to show the rest of the world that we mean business. I mean, it's the same strategy that Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore did in 1965. Mm. Mm. If you read his book, he says, I wanted an investor to know that when they land at Changi and they drive into the city, just looking around the road, the cleanliness, the orderliness, people will know that we mean business. And that's exactly, I think, what we did. I, I, I was a small boy in 77. But I believe that's, that's what led to it. And I think to some extent, I agree. But having said that, in 1982, if we had an election without going for that referendum, then we would have had a parliament for the first time under the proportional representation in 1982. Maybe, maybe that could have had a big impact on our ethnic relations. Maybe we could have avoided the bloodshed that post-83 this country uh, experienced. The death of our leaders, the death of youth from both sides of the divide, the heavy migration, the brain drain, the, some of the best and the brightest. We could have avoided all that. I don't know. These are all ifs and buts. Yeah. But certainly we didn't have an election in 82. Fast forward to 2017, in my prof uh, opinion, the 17th Amendment to the Constitution, 2007, I'm sorry, 17th Amendment to the Constitution was very good. Why? It brought in, you see, the, the 78th Constitution was about control, being vested with one person and a few others. The 17th Amendment took it out. You see, uh, uh, I, would, I call it the commanding heights of governance. You control the main points, you are in control. The 17th Amendment took that took away. That they said, yes, the president has the power. We look at the main positions that he can control through appointments. The judges, the attorney general, the IGP, the different commissions, the independent commissions, commissions the uh, election commission, police commission, human rights commission, uh, finance commission. So there were a number of commissions that the 17th Amendment really changed. They said, President can appoint, we acknowledge that the, the, any executive, it should come through the post of President, but you're not going to have unfettered discretion. Hmm. We are going to set up a thing called the Constitutional Council, 
that were comprised of politicians as well as others. That are the only constitutional council that had uh, uh, non-elected members on it. And I think the first chairman, if I remember, was Justice uh, A.R.B. Amar Singh, a highly respected judge and a jurist at that time. And uh, so every name that was brought forward to it for the appointment of these key positions was vetted. Which I think was a good thing. We took away from the individual dictates of a single person and put it in a committee. And hopefully people of good um, credentials. Fast forward it to the 18th Amendment. The f unfortunate thing is, if you look at the 18th Amendment, so you had the elections in uh, 2000 and Nine. 2019. Nine. 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 Uh, after the war. Nine. 2010, we had the elections. Yeah. It is after the So you, you have the elections, both 2005 and 2009 or 10 elections, under the good system to relative good yeah. system that the 17th amendment, amendment brought yeah. with an independent election commission mm. that election commission had the power to even take over state resources and run the election mm. army and the, Af the the forces were asked to report to him if necessary that power was given to the elections commission mm. so i think by and large the 2005 2010 elections were held then what happens after the election we change the constitution and bring in the 18th amendment what does the 18th amendment bring removes the two term limit of the president so that you can contest again and dilutes that safeguard oh. that the 17th amendment brought we fast forward to 2015 now if you really look at it by 2015 also it was a very hard fought election and I, f for once, was very proud of that election because that was the time the people actually voted on a policy. Mm. Because one party said, we are coming on a good governance policy. It was not about promising, I'm going to give you free food or free this or free that. It was on a policy. I thought our, our polity had matured, mm. all of us, when we voted. And it was not based on emotions. It, I mean, there was, yes. but certainly I, I, I like to think that the emotions that were brought out were brought out for the right reasons. Yeah, and also we had some kind of a solid plan. The 100-day plan was given, the three-month yes government uh, yes. and then the election so of course the plans will change nothing it, worked. I, mean, <laughs> so, I mean some of it worked some of it didn't of it but worked. most of it the most important thing is all those plans at least on public perception could be referable to a policy that all of us could refer to mm. good governance good governance means you run this place right, right. that's all that it means yeah. don't waste money that's it they, that comes in the 19th amendment now the 19th amendment was a watershed event in our constitutional history because it really diluted the old system of concentrating and depending on just one person, the president, to give direction to the country. That's what it did. It, the parliament recapped some of its power back, not all of it, some of it. And the most important thing is it brought in two new commissions, the Procurement National Procurement Commission and the National Audit Commission. Mm. Now, procurement is a very critical thing if you want to avoid, not avoid, minimize. One, procuring things that are not needed because you need to have a procurement plan, it has to be approved. So there is some uh, transparency, consultation, all that. And the second is that even once you decide to go for it, you have to go through a process where you have competition so people will get a good product for a lower price. Mm. That was important. Audit Commission gave a lot more power to the Auditor General and the National Audit Act was passed after that. Actually in the National Audit Act there is a clause which says that if anybody has taken a decision that has caused a loss to the state, the Auditor General can recommend recovering that loss from that person. That provision is there in the attack, 2018 or 19, if I, 18 or 19, I can remember the exact year. So that was brought in. And the third one is the National Police Commission. Mm. So all the promotion, transfer, dismissal of police officers was given to the National Police Commission, taking it out 
into and putting it into a separate commission. Come the 20th amendment, all those were taken out. National Police Commission is it's more like an agony aunt for the police now. Mm. And the money, the, the power was vested back into the National Public Service Commission. And the president took all the powers that the original 78 constitution had. Now the question is why? Why are we going back? Why do you need that amount of power? Why do you need that amount of power? So if somebody says, I need that power because I want to do good for the country, thank you very much, show us the results. If you don't show the results, then the obvious alternative viewpoint that the public is going to this thing is you took it because you wanted to abuse. Otherwise, show the results. So constitution is about how power is exercised on our behalf. What are the checks and balances? Who are the people we appoint to powerful positions? What sort of um, uh, vetting do we go through before we appoint them? Unfortunately for us, I think the involvement of the public in that process is very little. A lot of us, now we are forced to be involved because we are lawyers, but if we were not, if I was a, probably an executive in a different institution, I might not feel a direct need of knowing the constitution, the constitution principles, mm and holding my member of parliament accountable to it. But now, I face the music. True. So, I think that's where the constitution of this country is so, upon, and I'll finish this point by this. You see, if you look at the constitutional document and any other law, there's a difference in the language. Laws are very specific. You shall do this, you shall no. not do this, and you are as elaborate as can be. But the constitution is more broad in terms. And that is because you are expected to respect certain norms, uh, governance norms. You should not have conflict of interest. You will not appoint your brother or your son into posts that are paid for by the public because if you are paying out of the public funds, you must go through the process. There are certain norms. Now, if you are not used to these norms and you manage to come to a power because you are very popular, there you are going to find a mismatch. And our fault is we don't hold them accountable for not having those norms. Forget breaches of the law that the courts will look after. We don't even have the norms of proper conduct. Should I do this? In Sinhalese Danu, there is a saying, Lajja Bayar. We have lost both. But as, as the public, where did we go wrong in terms of giving this a celebrity, a star status to people of the parliament? We're going to be speaking about that because inviting them for weddings, inviting them as guests to cut off ribbon. But, but did we do it the right way or did we give place to the wrong people? We'll speak more when we do come back and also about uh, similar situations that certain countries have faced on the other side. Welcome to Date with Danu. So, before we went into a break, we spoke about have we hero worshipped the wrong people? How are we to be blamed for this? If you can give a perspective, uh, knowing we, we knew there was corruption around us, we knew there was public fund that was used the wrong way, we saw it, but all of us tend to look away because our lives were just, okay, we were able to move on. Where did we go wrong as the public? Because uh, I don't think in any other country we will like garland and invite people to like cut ribbons and Can make them to sign at weddings and well, I don't know, I just want to know. If I may. Yeah, please. Start from there. I don't think, I, I wouldn't say we have gone wrong. You see, when you say hero worship, I know what you mean. But also, I would re-articulate it in a, to give it a positive spin, is our respect for authority if properly exercised. Mm. You see, you look at the protests that is taking place in golfers, right? I think it's going to be a model for the rest of the world. Even if you look at this 1st of May, 
even in France, there was violence. But here, even the road in front of that is still, you, you can, can travel, it, you can travel. use it, which is great. You see, today when I was coming, driving to this show, hardly any vehicles on the road, but when a police officer puts its hand, I still stop the vehicle. Mm. Why? Because we have that inherent respect for authority, which I think is a cornerstone of running a country according to laws. Now the problem is, are people using that respect for authority for people in authority to abuse? Oh, wow. So true. <laughs> so our problem is actually not abuse of power, but the power to abuse. Yeah. And are they respecting their uniforms? Which, 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 which. So if somebody comes and says, so I understand this is the polity of the Sri Lankan nation, I'm going to play with you guys. Mm. They can easily do that. And again, coming to your question, why are we here of worshipping this? I would say it's not about hero worshipping. It's, not about, it's about not shunning them away. If you know somebody has taken a bribe, we still want to put a selfie with them. I've seen on Facebook, I mean, uh, social media. You can see when government change, a lot of pictures come. Hand around somebody, somebody at their wedding, praising them, wow, this man is, or this uh, woman has come back, I believe in you. And moment the government changes, the very same people change that and they say something else. I think the reason for that is the rulers and to some extent we and the private sector have created a system where we cannot progress unless we get the, the curtsy, un unless Favor. it's subject to the curtsy of the ruler. Mm. Whether mm. it's a tender, government land for businesses, even a simple permit to build your house. Mm. That, and because we don't resist that, they become celebrities. True. And we tend to think that if you're close to them, if you're seen with them, doors will open. And they love it. And they abuse it. And they have created, in Sri Lanka, a system has now been created. If you want anything significant, you can't go through the law. You come to me, if I only say yes. You'll get it done. You will get it done. And if I say yes, all your regulatory issues will disappear. Hmm. If I say no, from the building permit, all the way to your BOI approval, you will have all kinds of issues to deal with. It starts even with a driving license. It yes. starts even with a driving, driving license. license. Don't, don't, don't forget, we are a young democracy. Yeah. We got our independence only 70 years ago. Correct. We are still looking for the king also. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's true. Hmm. There were songs made about it as well. Yes. Yeah. Uh, George, tell me, uh, you were going to speak about a similarity in terms of a country and us. When you look at, for example, Venezuela, if you go back to the 1970s, Venezuela was thriving. This was identified as one of the richest countries in the world. Certainly a country doing extremely well in South America, considering the 60s, 70s, what South America was going through. Now, when you have a very solid system in place in that country, this is where the con constitutionally, when you look at it from a legal perspective, it was a very sound constitution. There were, there were lots of checks and balances in place. Mm. But then later on, you have personalities like Hugo Chavez coming into power. Now, the Venezuelan constitution even had a clause which said, you can serve two terms, but not consecutively. You had oh. to have a 10-year gap between your two terms. Okay. Now, Our ones can't go through a 10-year <laughs> gap. They might not <laughs> live that long. You can't go through a 10-month gap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? You need, uh, but why is that? Why is that? Now, look at how Venezuela, and what happened to that country? Today, what is that situation in that country? Uh, it is nowhere near where it was. Why? You messed around. And this is where, and this is something that we did, but thankfully we didn't go that far down the road. I mean, uh, we, we can't say that we are on Venezuela's road because we have not gone that far down. But Venezuela even went to the extent of uh, having a referendum which was challenged in the Supreme Court of that country. But of course, it was permitted. There were several who uh, challenged it, but they allowed the Supreme, uh, the Supreme Court allowed the referendum to go ahead. And through the referendum, the president decided to have a constituent assembly mm. which was going to determine what would happen next. And then once he won that referendum, he then decided, okay, 
I don't need the Supreme Court. I don't need the Congress. I want to suspend them. And then the Supreme Court also ruled saying, yes, uh, the Constitutional Assembly is much higher. It is above uh, our control as well. Now you have messed with it big time. Now you have people are really stuck. Who do they turn to? Now when they want to have an election, you can even have people you want voting. Yeah. So you have really seen a breakdown of democracy in that country. I guess they don't associate the word democracy with that country, sadly, anymore. Now, do we want to go there? No, we don't. But why do we go there? I mean, going back to that earlier question that you asked, why do we hero worship people? Why do we do these things? Let us not forget, let us at least now in 2022 start realizing this is another profession in this country. Yeah. People retire. People retire in all other professions. For goodness sake, we've even seen a pope retiring in the world. <laughs> Right? We've even seen that taking place. Why doesn't this happen in the political arena? If you can't, now we have a two-term period. If you can't do it in two terms, you do everything you can, right? Hopefully, you try to give up your best in those two terms. If you can't do any more, give it to someone else. That's what the Americans do. They have presidents who are going to retirement at a very young age. Mm. They're probably feeling uh, rather jobless. What do I do now? True. I mean, Obama must have felt very uh, listless, wondering, uh, my life yes. is kind of finished. finished. Uh, what do and I do next? He president in his 40s. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, but he, he continued with his life. He's yeah. alive, he's around, he's active, he's doing things. You can do things, you can contribute, you can become an elder statesman, you can be a personality who is respected. You don't have to be greedy for positions, greedy for power. In Sri Lanka, so many people, it, it, whether it's parliamentarians, whether it's presidents, we are seeing people who want to retain. You've tasted power. You know what it's like. You don't want to let go. Why? Because people around you have hero worship to such an extent that you've enjoyed this exalted position. Mm. But at the same time, who put them there? We did. Mm. Right? It's like, for example, you put them up there, they don't live up to your standards, you get disappointed. Then you want to cut the tree and bury them alive. Now, yeah. actually, it's not their fault at the end yeah. of the day. We have done that to them. Correct. You put an ornament on a very high shelf, it falls and breaks, that's your fault. Hmm. The ornament didn't climb up there. That is true. Right? So BMW. in the same way, people around this leaders are to also to blame. Important. You mm -hmm. have a vantage point. You are sitting in a place in which you can advise, you can caution. I don't want to go to use the word warn, but you can caution them saying, be careful, be mindful, this might happen. These are the consequences. Mm. People don't do that. This is the problem. Someone has got to play their devil's advocate role there and tell them, be careful, don't go down that road. Now, but this whole thing about call, like, you know, calling out the people who do wrong or even name shaming them publicly on social media had repercussions. They were to be, they were not there after that. Uh, or their accounts were banned or they were not, they were not seen in public. So only now do you think now the rulers are worried because the people have all come together. So whatever they do is now being questioned. Don't you think that was also an, a problem? Like we gave so much of power, we never questioned when somebody went missing. We, we have probably felt it's not me, so it's not my problem. When this is what we have done. When they came for the poor, yes. I didn't say anything. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. I wasn't, you, you, you it wasn't ignored me. it. You ignored yeah. those things because ah, it wasn't me. I wasn't affected. So it's okay. So it's okay. Now that's the wrong attitude. That's where unless everyone is protected, all are not protected. Like, you know, you are not protected at the end of the day. That is something that we are realizing now as a nation. We are realizing that we are moving ahead. People are becoming conscious. There's criticism saying, oh, only now. I'm happy that it's at least, at least now. now. At least now. Yeah. Right? Uh, at least now. At least yeah. that is something we've got to uh, look forward to. And please note, Venezuela has good looking people. We <laughs> don't even have that. <laughs> There's no way that we can grow our economy anytime soon. Uh, Mahesh, I, I wanted to speak about, um, you wanted to add something more to what Harsha was saying. Yes. So, I think uh, Mr. Fernando very rightly spoke about the commissions, the independence of the commissions and how that affects the rule of law. Now, I think one thing we need to remember is that we delegate power in the 17th because one person wants it differently, we change it 18th. Then again, there's a mandate to delegate power and then again, because one person wants it, we change it to give one, one person power. Constitutions cannot be amended for one person. 
constitution should not be amended for a cult of personality. The constitution is there for the people, right? And I don't think until very recently that the people of Sri Lanka understood the concept of sovereignty of the people. The people, the citizens of this country are sovereign. The president, the parliament, everybody exercises their power on behalf of the citizens of this country. And I think somewhere along the way, we either chose to ignore it, or we forgot it, or we did not care that the elected officials of this country are doing our work. They are working for us. It, it, is, it is not a monarchy. It is, it is not an elected dictatorship. But it is simply discharging duties for us. Now, why I say that? And why mandates and political will and accountability are important. Now, if you, if you look at it, um, in, in 2015, just before the parliament, one of the biggest issues was this bond scam, right? Huge investigation, lots of press, uh, and there was a clamor to hold people accountable. Right now, at that presidential commission, appointed by the president who was elected in 2015, so I was also there, I was also there. The Prime Minister of Sri Lanka gave evidence under oath. The Finance Minister of Sri Lanka gave evidence under oath. Now, there are a lot of problems with the Hapalane government. Huge problems with in effectiveness, uh, in communication, in communication the even, yeah. even, even the things that they did well in communicating. Uh, I think one of the biggest issues was they, they couldn't, they failed to communicate as to how the debt crisis was shaping economic policy, mm. uh, right? And, but huge issues. But the fact remains, a prime minister of a country went before a presidential commission, cross-examined by the Attorney General's department. Cross and that's a big step. That is a big step. That is accountability. That, that, that is what we should strive and to achieve. And the rule of law. Th that is what we should, and we should not, as a citizenry, settle for anything less. That, that, is, that is one of our core issues, because we settle for the bare minimum. Uh, different levels. Some person, one, a person would settle for a bath packet and a bottle. The other person would settle for a contract. The other person would settle to have the, uh, the fuel and the food and everything. And the other person will settle for, okay, I can go on my trips. It's a different level of comfort, but we would settle for it. Yeah. Whereas and we, we, stop we settling. Yeah, so the, it, it is, there is an accountability on, on, on the part of the people. In, in establishing independent commissions, truly independent commissions, which is why the 17th Amendment was so important, because you, you could establish commissions which were independent. And the 19th also. And the 19th also. But so what happens now is that you bypass. Now, for instance, uh, day before yesterday, students, people were arrested outside parliament on, the, on section 9 of the Parliamentary Privileges Act. Parliamentary Privileges Act outside. They were arrested on the Parliamentary Privileges Act. They, they, and the police, you saw, I think everybody's seen the watermelon video by now. Yeah. Right? Fried rice watermelon. Fried rice watermelon. Sounded like a bad Chinese meal. But you, when, when they went to the police, right, when, sorry, when they, were gone, when they were taken to court, the, uh, the magistrate issued personal bail. Because there is no case. You, that is not, there is no rule of law there. This is somebody saying, you know, I don't care what you do. Get rid of the protesters. That's why he said fried rice yeah. watermelon. <laughs> I, there are lots of theories about that, about whether that is code for water cannons and all that sort of thing. But, but the issue is, there is a disintegration of rule of law. But I don't want to discourage people, but if there is anything that you have seen in the l last month and a half, is that if people stand together, and if they stand firm, that no matter what, Steps that are taken to disrupt the protest. Now, there have been many steps to disrupt the protest, from having police buses outside Gotagogama, from uh, arresting people outside the president's house, from arresting this. So there, there will continue to be disruptions. Right? But if, if, you, if you look at it, that is also there because 
the National Police Commission is not functional. The, I must say, though, sir, the Human Rights Commission has done a Very good wonderful job, job so, far. In, so far in the last one and a half months. They have taken, they have uh, paid heed to the uh, complaints that have come and they have taken proactive steps, which mm. has not necessarily been the case in the past. Mm. They have taken proactive steps to protect the people. Right? This coupled with the international pressure that is coming has ensured that we have a semblance of rule of law despite the constitution, mm. despite attempts. So, so the accountability also comes from political will and the need to hold people accountable from the citizens themselves. It right. does not operate in isolation. We are going to speak about the 21st Amendment that has been put out there saying we need a change. What should the 21st Amendment have? I'm going to speak to you all about it. And also, are we going to go forward with the 21st Amendment or not? There are so many things that everyone has given an opinion about what should be added to the 21st Amendment. But what really needs to be added, we'll speak more when we do come back to speak about it. It's day Welcome back to the show. 21st Amendment. Now we have come there as well. Uh, how many amendments has the United States gone through? Is it 26, I think. 26 or 27. In how many years? 250 years now? 259, 18, yeah. 7. Yeah. We have such a wonderful race there. Yeah. I hope the 21st will at least stay a little longer than what we're expecting. Now a lot of people have given a lot of ideas that needs to be added into this 21st Amendment. Everyone, even I can say, you know, saying, you know, please make sure that Apili Andal has a highway because that gives me the chance. Highways are a must that everything needs to connect to Colombo. But it's impossible to do all of this. Please tell me, the Constitution, what should it actually hold? <sighs> okay, you start and then you come about what, okay. what? Three opinions on this, please. Dana, to be very honest, I don't look at the Constitution amendment until it reaches some degree of finality. Okay. Because there are so many drafts, so many views that come in, but that's part of the process. So without asking what should the 21st Amendment be, I would recommend that we do two things. One is, let's agree on the basic principles that should go into it. Get some agreement on that. I mean, we have now experimented enough, 20 amendments. In 40 we years. I th in, in 40 years, or so in 74, uh, yeah. I mean, two constitutions mm. uh, since uh, we got uh, yeah. independence from the British. So we have experimented. So we, I think now, at least now, there is a very widespread consensus as to what's wrong. I mean, everybody knows, essentially, it's at public financial management. And public financial management is at this stage because the systems and processes that was supposed to stop this from happening got abused because you appointed people who could be abused for whatever reasons. And then those safeguards we had to stop your relation and your friend being appointed was taken away so that anybody who did the appointment had a sort of a freeway. And if you really keep connecting the dots, you will see how everybody is connected to everyone else mm. to by and large especially these uh, appointments that are made for three years, five years, different boards, guys. So I think we now kind of know. So let's agree on the principles that what we want to know. And I think fundamental to those principles, we can go back to our own original constitution. Say, for example, we have a chapter called Directive Principles of State Policy. It simply says, let everybody have a decent education. Let everybody have enough to eat. Let there be opportunities for somebody to make a living, like the example you gave. The government's job is not to give jobs, but to create an environment so that will get generated. So we know what the role the government should play. At least now we are beginning to realize it. So one is that. The second thing I think it's important is the process of meeting it. Are we going to let, I, I, I personally think a set of lawyers can't draft constitutions. You must have the sociologists, the historians, the anthropologists, the economists coming in and understanding what is it that the country needs. 
You need people's representative giving the views of the people. You have to develop the process to do that. And then the lawyers can bring in the legality, the legal principles, and of course put it into legal form. But if you start with the lawyers, I think we are going to get a very uh, legalistic uh, kind of thing that may too far from the what people want. Right? So, so th those I think is the other two key things. If you get that right, like a train, if you lay the track right, you will get to the destination you want. Our problem is we start from the destination <laughs> and let them to work. So I am unable to answer your question as to what the 21st Amendment should look like. But certainly, if you look at the pluses and the minuses of all the amendments we have done, I think now, if you want to see, you know what we need. Right. What would be a few things that you will say that should never come in? Should never come in? Yeah. I think it's not about never come in, no? it what yeah. should, be, should come what in. What should come in? I mean, never come in, there will be so many things. Uh, I don't know, should come in, okay, my wish list, if, if I was given a... This is what everyone has been yeah, writing, a wish on, list. On, on, on principle, if, if we, we are to get something, I would say a mechanism to remove nepotism and financial accountability. So, how, how, do, how would we do that? First of all, if you are given a ministry, so I also think we need standards for ministers, like for cabinet ministers, for at least to have, because the common argument now is that you don't need to have any expert knowledge or any knowledge in the area that you are a cabinet mini or you, your ministry because it is the public service that runs the ministry, right? So you have it from your secretary to economic experts. I think we need to change that. I, I think we need to have a mechanism by which that a cabinet minister in charge of ministry has to have some knowledge, some education on that particular area. So you have that. Then you remove, you need to have remove family members from being appointed to staff of your ministries. What are your qualifications? So how, how do you, you can't just say don't appoint family members. So you enact strict measures, educational qualifications, professional qualifications, experience. Though if you put those criteria as mandatory for staff members, then you at least have the framework by which you can have competent people working for the ministry. Number three is financial accountability. Now we, we have now I think um, the Honorable Minister Nama Rajapaksa recently said that he has filed his uh, parliament declaration, asset declaration form every year. Filing the asset declaration form and the veracity of the uh, asset declaration form are two different things. So we need a method by which you can actually verify the asset declaration form and anybody who goes into politics the the brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts, anybody who is connected, there should be a mechanism by which their assets can be examined on request. If there is an investigation, if there is a credible com complaint, those assets have to be complained, uh, can be looked into. The Auditor General's company needs to have professional forensic accountants, forensic investigations who are able to follow the money it's it's a very very yeah, yeah. your wish list is a bit not even santa can answer that no it's 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 actually not that difficult it's it's just about tweaking a few things here and because as, as you see the audit, audit the, com the commissioner the commission is already there it's just a matter of including professionals forensic accountants there and making that truly accountable you put professional uh, the the public service commission can easily very easily say okay you need to have these qualifications in order to serve in a minister's staff. These are not very difficult things, but these things will actually make it more easier for us to hold politicians accountable. Talking about education in the areas that you are going into, George, you were with the foreign services for a long time and then you left. Was education appreciated? Not at all. <laughs> not at all. You can take some time to answer that. But, but <laughs> no. <laughs> I was told at that time 
that there was no need to pursue a PhD. Uh, I should just stop easy academic work and instead focus on hard ministry work. This was the secretary of the ministry who said this. Easy academic work. Easy oh, academic oh, work. Oh, and that person actually had the audacity to sit back in his chair and say, I have a BSc mathematics and I am the secretary. That was the level to which people stoop. You see how, how close-minded, how That's they ridiculous. do not see potential, they do not see opportunity. Look at the other foreign services around the world. Look at how they are focusing on jo on-the-job training, enhancement, programs. I remember Thailand. Some years ago when I was in a fellowship in Thailand, I got an order the Sri Lankan desk officer at the Thai Foreign Ministry was on their way to Harvard. The person coming back to replace the person had just finished a program in Yale. These are the people whom we've got to go negotiate with, deal with, talk to, have discussions and who did with. We right? And these are, uh, well, our people are not getting those same kind of opportunities, obviously. Are they willing to learn? Are they willing, are they, are they hungry to achieve those? Because I'm asking these postings are given, sometimes we wonder how in the world are they there in these countries? How do So that is probably the political posting, Correct. the political how, appointments. But, but yet, at the end of the day, it's still a posting, it's still representing our country. I mean, if you look at the two, if you look at career and political, I'm not saying the career is entirely bad. There are mm. some amazing personalities, and there are some personalities who uh, have... Amazes much, you. Who yeah. amaze me, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right? So how they get in there, how they function is a different question. But talking about political appointees, there have been fabulous political appointees in the past. We can look at personalities who have made such a huge contribution to the uh, progression of this country internationally. Now, they were there, they have been retained by consecutive governments. We'll take someone like Hamilton Shirley Amrasinghe. He has been appointed by Dardy Senanayake, Sirimao retained him. Jaja Vardhana has him for a short time. This man now goes on to become the chair of the Law of the Sea Conference. This is an exalted position. They are determining the continental shelf, they are determining land of countries, the sea, the maritime resources of countries. And do you know that Sri Lanka does not put forward his candidature when it is time for re-election? Other countries get together and put him forward as their candidate and he wins. Slap in the face for Sri Lanka at that point. Huge no-no on the part of Jaya Vardhana. He really made a big blunder. Now, these are things where political appointees have done amazingly well there. But let's come back to things happening right here at home. Because end of the day, we are looking at foreign funding. And that's what we, we have literally begged across the world. And I think leaders might not even answer our calls now. They're like, oh, I'm at the call. Absolutely. Like, it's one of those. Absolutely. It's a credibility so, issue. Yeah, yeah. And so on that level, when we do represent and have our embassies there, we are actually like, that's the only way we can gain some kind of respect for our country. We to need to push our people. We need to give them the opportunities. They've got to come back. They've got to contribute. They've got to bring back. They've traveled around the world. They've seen the world. You can't come back and go into this mold again. You've got to bring that experience. I'm not saying come and replicate it here. We need to grow something internally, but we need to be mindful that there are other developments out there. How can we enhance what we are doing? How can we improve ourselves? That's what we're supposed to be doing. Personally, imagine how much more you do it for a country. Look at what we are doing, for example, in the arena of um, uh, recruiting people. When we are looking at the recruitment process, how the examinations are held, how rarely the examinations are held, how rarely the recruitment process takes place. Look at how we are closing down missions. We've closed down Sydney. We closed down the consulate in Sydney in the 75th year of diplomatic relations between Sri Lanka and Australia. Is that how we celebrate relations with Australia by shutting down a mission in that country? We're closing down Oslo, or we have closed down Oslo. It's a huge mistake, the effects of which will be felt in the years ahead because of our past. I don't want to go too much into detail there because that's going to become a very controversial issue. Oslo, Why don't you tell Norway. Us a bit of a, re bit of a s recap of it. You don't want to have a distancing from Norway. Norway is a country which has been very much involved with this country. We've had peace processes involved. They've come in as mediators, facilitators. They've been very much involved in this country. They've been involved with the government. They've been involved with the rebel group. We don't want to go down that road where you see us distancing ourselves now suddenly from Norway, and you find others finding solace in Norway. You don't want that happening. 
And that is a huge fear that I have. We are shutting down missions because we do not have the money to run the missions. Now, if you want to improve your economy, you want to get things from outside. The tentacles out there are the missions. They are supposed to be well equipped, well staffed, well mandated to go out there and achieve that. You can't sit in Colombo uh, and hope that the world is going to start come and pouring things in here. We should be traveling around the world. Right now, we should have uh, ambassadors, ministers, not only the foreign minister, the foreign minister especially, but other ministers also assign travel, meet countries, seek assistance, do that. Instead, we sit on a high horse and we think, oh, they will come to us. Same thing happened with China at the beginning of this year. Last year, we had certain issues concerning fertilizer. A lot of things came to a helm at that point. The, it took the Chinese foreign minister to come to Colombo in January to try to sort things out. Now, that's China via Sri Lanka. Now, I think we need to get off this high horse that we are on. We can't expect other countries to, oh, Sri Lanka, we better go and do something for them. That's not going to happen. So, we go to extremes. We either take the begging bowl and we go around the world and we are begging from countries, certain countries, we are begging continuously from India. India is giving and giving and, and giving. giving. And then we also have the audacity to criticize India. Now, anyone gives something expecting something in return. There is no such thing as a free lunch. So, you have got to accept that. Same thing with China. We are asking and they are giving. If they do not give, now we say, ah, oh, they are not giving us. <laughs> What's wrong with them? They are supposed to support us. Support. No, they are not supposed to do any of those things. We have messed up relations with Japan. Right. We stopped the monorail project. Yeah, true. That was going to be an amazing project for this country. And that was all because of a commission issue. Yeah. So well, it, this is it was a 1% loan which did not kick in for 15 years. 40 years. For 15, so 40, 40 years. Yeah. Long number. Yeah. So, at the, we had amnesty. Mm. So, like we did not have to repay it for like. Do not so forget the MCC. Yeah, MCC. Yeah. We, we kick things in the mouth. We kick those gift in million. the mouth. And we did not take it. We did not take it. And now, we are in a really difficult position. You see, this is where people need to stop and realize you are not playing with uh, your domestic uh, budget at home. You are not trying to manage something in your neighborhood. This is a country and its future. Today, Sri Lanka is in this position because we have not looked to that future. Leaders have They've always, always focused thought of five years. Exactly. The next not election. How years. do I make the most on five, six years? How do I make the most while I am here? Right? The country? Nobody cares about the country. Unfortunately. We're going to get into a break. I'm going to come back and speak about our former leaders. Leaders who have taken decisions that have either contributed to this country or destroyed the country. Let's speak about these leaders and also more when we do come back on the show. So in conversation with Harsha, Mahesh and George, we're speaking about the constitution, the changes we hope for. Uh, let's speak about some of our former leaders and the policies that they have put down to paper and what happened. Uh, I'm going to let the two legal representatives give me an insight to some of the policies that were made that sort of crippled our country. I think, uh, Danu, there are too many to come up as examples. So, may I put this, because of in the interest of time, let's look at our leadership styles. Because that will help us to decide who are the leaders who did what. We have two types of leadership. One is the one who reacts to people's expectations. The leadership, the role, hmm. they look nice. They say, I'll That's do right. everything for you. People, they'll follow you even over the cliff. Then there is the leadership, the activity, where you say, look, this is what the country needs. Let's try to get it. Now, I think that leadership, the activity, is something that we don't have because most of the leaders didn't have the skill set to provide leadership in that way. Listening to my two colleagues, you asked me the question, what, what, what would I put into a constitution? I think one of the things that I would put into a constitution is to bring in the incentives why people do what they do and find mechanism to deal with it. He spoke about education. What's happening? If the head of the department doesn't have, has not got there based on education and competence, the rest of the department is going to find it very difficult to go up on education and competence. And you have a gradual decline. So, the, 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 if you look at leaders and what they have done, as I said, there are some good policies, 
there are some bad policies. But it all got through because of the way we allowed them to get away with it, because the way we elected. Face it, most of you are watching this program, at least know one person who has got some contract, a tender, some benefit which you don't deserve. Maybe your money is hidden elsewhere, maybe your money is invested here. You know it. And now today, what is the use of having huge amounts of dollars or rupees in your bank account when you can't go to a market and buy a packet of milk? They didn't think of that now. Still they don't think of it. So that's where we are now. So who is the person who can give leadership to tell the people at least now, enough is enough. You voted somebody into parliament because he's nice. He gave you a free three-wheeler ride. Did you ask about the question that one day he might become a minister, minister of education? We look for the tuition master's qualifications before we send our child for tuition. But we don't consider about the guy's qualification who decides on the policy of what my child will learn. Mm. And then we start mm. about it, saying, look at the parliament, look at there. I think the problem is, it's, that's where we're, and that's where the constitution needs that incentive structures even if we get a bad leader, the structure would be strong enough to force him to behave in a way, at least to some extent, that would be good for us. We need that structure coming in, which we don't have right now. Mahesh. So, but that is also with regard to how we have held people accountable in the past, uh, or the lack thereof. Yeah. Right. So I mean, if, you, if you, as Mr. Fernando said, so many policies that have gone on. But let's let's just look at. In, in, a, in a very, uh, very quickly, the, the different uh, ways in the last two governments had approached foreign relations and how the economic stand. Now, for instance, from 2009, we, we lost GSP Plus, which is like a massive incentive because the, the apparel sector is one of the sectors that actually keep bringing oh. in so many uh, dollars to this, to this country, right? Right, and, and, and what happened? Like, because of our policies with regard to the international community in our, in our need to say, you know what, we, we uh, the, the issue, our issues at the Human Rights Council with the UN, we lost that. And that is purely because of policy decisions made locally to appease the local uh, electorate that we lost that. No one thought of the long-term repercussions of that. And then when you go back, and you, you in, when you get that, then it's like, oh, you're selling the country out. You, you, are, uh, you are negotiating with foreigners. You're trying to, but which is what happened with the MCC agreement. So it's like, oh, you're, you're giving land. You're, you're trying to you're sell this really country out. It. So that is also us, right? Because we fall for it. Oh. We, we fall for this nonsense. It says, oh, you're selling this country, you're selling this country. You're OK with Port City being given to China, but you're not OK with the 500 million grant from the MCC. Oh. So, where, 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 do, where are we holding people accountable? Mm. Uh, their policies, the government policies are dictated to as by what we are willing to put up with. Mm. Now, for instance, very re about a year ago, there was a statement saying money printing does not lead to inflation. <laughs> right? I, I'm not an economist, but I know that's not true. Yeah. Right? So, when you see that, and if you are not agitated by that, and if you do not want to take action against that, and if you do not have the political will to go forward and say, listen, this is wrong, right? We are going to get into trouble. There is no point in a segment of people in Colombo saying that. But that message has to go out, that the collective uh, need to hold people accountable. So that is, that is the problem with policies. They're, they're, first of all, we, we don't have uh, Consistency in policy because all the new government wants to do is change the policies What's of the old government and the and Japanese. Nothing continues. Nothing. It's just so the Japanese, the rail project, monorail project is a perfect example. That was a fantastic project given to us, but we changed it because why? Because we, the new government didn't want to, to follow what the old government did. did, and also go through the procurement process. Procurement process all Which over. Which Jai was insisting on. Yes. Yeah. And so then eventually, who is going to suffer with us? Because yeah. we are just going to be stuck in and stuck. and Jaika. Uh, I, I, I don't know, I think they've, they've done so many projects in Sri Lanka, but they are very insistent on, on a very structured procurement, pro procurement process. Mm. Right. And, and that is very, very hard, hard to get. Yeah. But uh, one question, Mahesh, as someone who is who's a criminal lawyer as well, do you think these people, if we, if we hold them accountable, can they be brought to the court of law 
because a president is so he cannot be questioned. Well, he cannot be questioned while he's president, but can he can be questioned be que afterwards. Yes, yeah, of, course. of course, of course. You you are. You and do you think that will ever happen? I think we have a golden opportunity to do it, because I don't think we've had a moment in our history since I don't I don't think even in 1948 when we wanted independence, we were disunited. I think for the first time in our country's history, we have a fantastic opportunity to hold our elected officials accountable. Now, that cannot work if the moment these guys get out of power, somebody cuts a deal and does not uh, want to pursue action or deliberately sabotages the investigative process. That cannot happen. Even day daylight murders or disappearances, have yet not been brought to justice. And that has been like, that has been the carrot that has been put in front of people to even vote. You know, we'll solve Tajuddin's case tomorrow. We will solve who, who, who killed this journalist, who, who shot this journalist in broad daylight. But we have never got the answers to it. Yep. And every party that has come into power has played that card. But Danu, that is because they've never had an incentive to do so. What is the incentive? Because if you're going to be elected again in five years, hmm. you, you ride out these five years, then you move, and then you, in five years' time, you say something and come back into power. Why we have not held people accountable? We gave a party that perpetrated an illegal coup two-thirds majority one year later. We are as responsible for this. Hmm. So where is the accountability? Where is the incentive? That is what we should not settle. If the go this government resigns, we should not settle for that. We should push ahead and ask for more because that is our right because we are sovereign and it is our country and our entitlement and it's our entitlement we are entitled to that we do not serve at the pleasure of the politicians they serve for they serve us george can you add some of the faces or people you know give us a few incidents or from your historical knowledge <laughs> no i mean one of the things going back to what mahesh said we've set very low standards we and then we think, oh, they've done this, so that's amazing. That's something marvelous. They built roads. They built roads. <laughs> so that's good. I mean, the importance of connectivity. Talk about the bigger picture. You know, one thing that we have not done effectively from independence to date is communicate. Communication is zero. Whether it's this government, the earlier government, or any government that we have had, we've always seen a huge lack in that communication ability in getting your message across for what it is, explaining the pros and cons to people. There being a very healthy debate in society, people being aware of policies, going for elections and voting based on policies, not on am I getting a rebate on my tax? Do I have a jogging track outside my house? How is this going to affect my wallet? No, this is what we are doing. We're just looking at it, me, myself, and I, and I'm, I'm, I'm reiterating this over and over again. But if we go back to independence, if we take that period, if we look at some of the policies that were put into place, uh, the party that was formed at independence, this was all to do with bringing people together. You know, they had a noble objective there. How much that continued is questionable. Mm. You have then people coming in saying, oh, look at the demography of the country we can probably m take advantage of the population and the numbers in communities. Selfish, no, utter selfishness on their part. And they rode to power. Now, try to correct that. Those who talked about unity opposed those correctional methods. So you see, at the end of the day, this is collusion. Mm. They're all in it together. This is something that has been repeated by certain politicians who have end up, ended up in jail, where it is one fraternity. You stick out for each other. That is what we are seeing happening. And that is where nobody is sticking out for the people. Nobody is sticking out for Sri Lanka. It's just, I'll look after you, you look after me. And as a result, the country is just falling apart. And when I come to power, I will solve you. How, yeah. how many people in parliament today do you think really wants to abolish the executive presidency? Absolutely. This is my goal. How many people do you think really want to do it? How many people understand the executive presidency? How many of them understand the constitution? How many of them have read the constitution? <laughs> read the constitution there is a, something that I've asked. You never want to educate the people who will elect you, right? You were trying to add something. I actually want to ask this as a final question before we close. So there is Gota Gogama or a... Uh, uh, Maina. Na, Maina Gogama. Yeah, that's the Naki Maina Gogama and there's also the Hora oh, yeah. Gogama. Hora Gogama. Hora Gogama. So these are the Gamas that are there. 
and there have been a lot of conflict. What is personal opinions of this protest happening? Today there is a harata. Is this an advantage, disadvantage? Because dif different people get affected differently. What is your viewpoint before we wrap this up? I know we have a short time. Okay. I think what is our crisis? It's a dollar crisis. What do we need to solve this crisis? Dollars. Do we need a lot of it? No. Sri Lanka is small. Three, four billion dollars infusion within the next six, seven months will resolve our problems to a large extent. Can we get it? If we set the correct way? Yes. So where does this protest fit into this issue? So I think two things can happen. Number one is these protests are done in a unique way compared to the protests that we have known in Sri Lanka that one could say, okay, let them continue, I will continue. Disregard it. Saying that, okay, no pressure on me, I have my guards, I will continue, I will try to ride this wave through. That is one way that one could think. So then the question is, how can we sustain this protest in, uh, to a point where the pressure will be felt by the people whom the public holds as responsible for this mess? That's the first point. The second point is, how do you attract dollars? You see, Governor Cabral's policies ultimately resulted in where even a housemaid working in the Middle East stopped sending money through the formal banking system to their starving family. And then we expect to attract million dollar investments. Mm. That's the reality of it. So now, hopefully things will change. I think if you look at the way Gota Gogama or these protests are taking place, for me, it's a lovely uh, example in democratic protest. It's non-violent, it doesn't impact the ordinary lives of the people, at least uh, in, in a normal way. So I think we have a huge marketing opportunity here for the rest of the world to say, look at Sri Lanka. We express dissent, we change governments in a way that falls in line with what you want, especially the countries that can give us dollars. For all this time, things like accountability, transparency and anti-corruption has been branded as Western, so therefore you are not nationalist if you speak for those. That's the way some with Western interests have branded those principles and some people have lapped it up. I think now we need to change that. If you want investors, show the world that we listen to dissent. Show the world that we are democracies are strong enough to change. Show the world that our laws are respected so that when you bring in your money here, your investment is protected. If there is a dispute, the courts will come in and secure that money for you. Show the world that I'm not going to issue a gazette today and reverse the decision two days later and you don't know what to do with your investment. Be honest, at least about our interactions with the IMF. Tell the truth because the businessmen will make decisions. Don't forget, right now, Sri Lanka has a lot of assets if, if you take our capital markets. We have a lot of companies that has a lot of value. Market is down, but value is there. So any smart investor will see it. If they have extra money, park it here. Five years later, you will take a huge return. Now it's up to us to create that environment and give the signal, bring it. To that to happen, we need changes that the world is looking for. So if people can't understand that, that's our funeral, not theirs. So the protest themselves, the right to protest in Sri Lanka is basically enshrined. So it's in the constitution, there is case law. Now to, with regard to today's Hartal, the issue is I think anybody who's protesting should have the freedom to protest because I think we need to understand that not all of us have the luxury to protest. Correct. It is a luxury. Right, so what I don't want in a situation of Hartal is there to be social pressure or pressure by unions to close their shops because most of these people live day to day, right? So as much as we have the freedom to dissent, those who cannot protest should have the freedom not to protest because they can't afford to, right? And that is the way forward. We need to protest for those people who cannot protest. There is always going to be uh, issues, there's always going to be uh, a way to agitate the protesters because that is the only way you can shut down these protests. As long as we, the protesters, remain peaceful, you cannot shut down these protests. And that is, that is why we are here. That is why this awareness is here because of the protests. So that is the positivity of it. The negativity of it is, of course, 
you you need to give fr freedom to those who don't want to protest or cannot protest to not do so and not enforce hartals because at the end of the day we are fighting for all of us george the protests are excellent they must continue it is bringing pressure pressure which is bringing change it will take time it's not going to happen overnight we're not going to see a miracle happening in a day or two but this is where people have woken up politicians have woken up leaders have woken up the people of this country have woken up finally we must not miss this opportunity this is an opportunity for change that we've been needing for a very long time change that we deserve this is not a country that is bereft of resources this is not a country isolated somewhere in the world this is not a country that was created yesterday this is a country which is steeped in history steeped in culture steeped in tradition we've had engagement going back centuries we've been known as a unique entity in this part of the world we are an island but we are not an island in that sense of the world mm. we're not cut off isolated we don't deserve this that is where leaders have got to realize right now yes you were elected but it just so happens that you've messed it up you've made mistakes you've admitted to those mistakes go out in a dignified manner have a certain ounce of possibility of coming back later you might do something marvelous later on and come back you want to keep that chance open you don't want to have to go into exile we don't want to see anyone that happening to anyone you see how the slandering statements that are coming out people are calling for going home going to jail people are even asking them to go away completely now what a sad situation this is these are people who as a recently an actress said people who should have been worshiped at some point for the contribution they made etc as controversial as that may be you had a certain position don't lose it you have lost it don't lose it any more you don't want it to deteriorate to such an extent where it's going to become worse why are tourists not coming to this country not because of the protests the tourists are joining in the protests the tourists are unable to travel because of a lack of fuel in this country because of shortages in this country it's not because of the protests so anyone trying to label mm. the protests as being a detractor to tourists and affecting tourism so, yeah. affecting foreign exchange is a very wrong thing to do that is true you are misleading misguiding the people you are misleading the international community so there's no there's no oil for people to yeah. fry give our chinese rolls for them to Danu, eat. this is actually a true yeah. story then if you if you are shareholders of a company and the ceo and the cfo and their families who were in the company bankrupt the company what do you do you suspend them you have an audit so that is normal if you can do it in a company if you have bankrupted a company that that is not in dispute you have bankrupted a company what is the solution you can't let those people who created the problem solve the problem mm. i think mm. i know with the three of us i'm the oldest may i say this i still have a lot of hope that we will get through this well, if we are ready to do what needs to be done and that's nice is resilient we are a very resilient we are, we are very resilient we went through a war 30 right? years 30 of 30 years of war a we tsunami a tsunami we can do this as long as we stand together as one people yeah. we Amazing. cannot let a few people hold us to ransom thank you for that positive positive end to the show thank you so very much for being here it has been absolutely lovely uh, coming to know the in depth a meaning of all what we are reading about or hearing and what is the purpose behind it i hope you were able to get some insight as well just the way i understood it uh thank you so very much for being a part of the show sri lanka as george said is such a beautiful country opportunities have opened up for so many people to leave don't because i think we need everyone here to make this country what it is we were wanted by a by all the countries across the world for us being a natural harbor that it serves say something that we are the hub that everyone wants to be in let's not give the hub to others let's just be here so on that note we need to wrap things up thank you for being on the show we will see you with another cool episode today with danu to then keep smiling it's a wrap <laughs>